Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to get us started. I'm Katie Jacobs from the CIPD, and I'd like to welcome you to our penultimate coronavirus webinar for 2020. Uh, now, those of you who've been with us through, from the beginning might, might remember that I did our very first coronavirus webinar. I hosted it from this lovely blue sofa in April. Uh, and did I still think that we would be doing it in December? Um, no, to be honest, I didn't, but here we are. And it's relevant I mentioned that today because we're discussing the health and well-being impact of being very much in it for the long haul. And while every day brings really encouraging news about vaccines, the government has still recommended that those who can work from home until April 2021 and uncertainty remains over how long we're going to be living in the shadow of the coronavirus. What impact does this have on both our mental and our physical health and how can employers help to mitigate that impact. That's what we're going to be discussing this afternoon and joining me I have an esteemed panel of experts. I'm joined by Rachel Suff. Rachel is Senior Policy Advisor Employment Relations at the CIPD and our expert on all things health and well-being. Professor Neil Greenberg, Professor of Defence Mental Health at King's College London and Dr Joe Yarker, Director of Affinity Health at Work. Thank you all very much for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm just going to do the housekeeping notes as ever. Um, this session is being recorded. You will be able to access it later on demand. You'll be able to find it on the CIPD website. You will also be able to download all the slides. Um, so everything will be available from later today or from tomorrow. If you would like to submit a question during the session, and please do, can I ask you to use the Q&A tab, which you can see at the bottom of your screen. If you want to ask a question to the panel, use the Q&A tab. But if you want to um, chat among yourselves, um, make any nice points, introduce each other, do a bit of networking, then do use the chat function. It's always really great to see people connecting in there. Remember that the CIPD Coronavirus Hub is there for you as a resource and that we are adding things to it all the time. And remember that for legal advice, CIPD members can call our HR Inform helpline, which is available 24 seven, and you'll be able to get an individual response on any of your trickiest legal issues. And I also want to flag, given the topic of this webinar, our wellbeing helpline that's available for members in UK and Ireland. Working with Health Assured, we can now provide CIPD members with free help and support via sessions as qualified therapists, which you can access online and over the phone. And Health Assured have also recently launched a new app, which is available for you as well. The My Healthy Advantage app provides an enhanced set of wellbeing tools designed to improve your mental and physical health that you can access anytime, anywhere. And I think we'll give you some more info about that and where you can find it at the end of the session. So on with our topic for this afternoon. As I mentioned at the start, we have been in this for nine long months now. And I don't know about you, but for me, winter and those nights drawing in ever earlier hasn't made living under COVID restrictions any easier. And as I look outside of my window now, it is uh, pouring with rain and very gray. So it all feels rather depressing. People are dealing with a range of issues from anxiety to isolation, loss of income, concern over the threat of redundancy. Some people are dealing with heavier workloads than ever before and feeling burnt out. They're not so much working from home as they are living at work. And all of this is triggering or exacerbating mental health issues. And for some who caught the coronavirus, they're living in the shadow of long COVID. Sufferers can experience symptoms including fatigue, brain fog, breathlessness and pain long after their initial diagnosis. They might be unable to work for months, which poses a major long-term challenge for both employers and employees. So there's a lot of issues there for individuals and by extension, the people profession to have to deal with. During the session, our panel is going to offer practical advice and guidance around maintaining resilience and around how to support employees who may be struggling. We will also discuss how to manage long-term sickness absence and provide effective assistance and support for return to work and beyond. So Rachel, Neil, and then Joe will each present, and then we're gonna take your questions. But please do get your questions in throughout uh, so I can keep an eye on them and make sure to ask, uh, ask the most relevant ones. Um, but that's it from me for now. I'm gonna hand over to Rachel, who's gonna kick us off with some context. Thank you, Katie. Really glad you could all join us today. Could I have the first slide, please? Thank you, Danielle. Well, I, I think you introduced that topic really well, um, Katie. In it for the long haul, I think really captures how a lot of us are feeling about the current phase of this crisis. 
It's so uplifting to hear about news of the vaccines. Um, the first one is making its way to us now, but we don't know what the timelines are for rolling that out across the whole population. And we are still in it for the long haul. There's a the light at the end of the tunnel, but we are still, I think, in that tunnel. And many, many months, now into this crisis it's really clear that it's not only a, a physical uh, threat to our health but also a mental health threat as well at the very least many are feeling very worn down by the ongoing situation and organizations really need to start thinking now if they haven't already about the longer term support that they are going to provide for people where it's needed First of all, there's a lot of unknowns about the longer term impact of the disease itself on people. You've mentioned long COVID and it's clear that a certain proportion of people who've had COVID, not necessarily badly, nonetheless, they're not recovering or not recovering fully. This has prompted the NHS to set up a task force and invest millions in a network of long COVID clinics. So the medical profession is still developing an, under an understanding of this condition, but it's clearly a complex one. It's clear there's a wide range of different ongoing symptoms. As you said, Katie, many people can't work for several months or can't work for full, capac uh, full capacity. Of course, it's a major challenge for those individuals themselves, and I know some people affected as well, but also for employers in terms of what is the appropriate kind of support for managing what is in effect a complex, chronic, ongoing health condition, and not just a bit of post-viral fatigue. And it's clear that the challenges as well from, from long COVID, that there are other wider impacts in terms of uh, people's mental health as well, that mental health charities like Mind are warning us, haven't peaked yet and can potentially carry on for some people after the pandemic. Next slide, please. Now, we've been regularly surveying employers, but also employees as well about the own experience of the situation and how they feel about it as well. This is the most recent results. And we asked people at work, as a result of COVID-19, are the following better or worse off? On the left-hand side, you can see that pie chart represents how people feel about their physical health. On the right-hand side, it's about their mental health. And in both cases, almost half said no change. But almost half, well, 40% in the case of physical health, 45% in the case of mental health said it had got worse since the pandemic. So that's not unexpected, is it? But I think this does bring home that people's mental health has been affected. Now, I want to put a caveat here because this doesn't mean that everyone who said that their mental health had got worse now has a diagnosed mental health condition by any stretch. I think we need to remember that we can't all feel great all the time and our mental health, it's normal for it to fluctuate almost on a, on a daily basis uh, uh, from, from good to poor and so on. But the fact remains that the challenges to many people's mental health are very real. Some groups in particular will be more affected and will have developed symptoms of, of mental, mental health conditions, but it is a complex area. And I know Neil is gonna come in and, and talk about that in more depth because we do need an evidence-based under, understanding. Could I move on to the next slide? Now we also asked people, and, and this was a, a real leap out finding for me, as a result of COVID-19, are your social connections at work better or worse off? This is the pie chart on the left. And you can see that around half again said no change, but 42% said that they're worse. And again, this isn't a surprise, but for me, it's, so, it's concerning because I think we gain so much from those positive relationships, that peer support that we get from work and can be really beneficial for our well-being. It's not surprising that this is the finding because 
because so many of us now are working on our own at home. But it, this is an important area, I think, for organisations to focus on going forward for the longer term. And also in terms of financial security, just over a third, 36% said, that was worse off as well. And of course, we're only at the beginning of the economic crisis. We saw the Chancellor's announcements last week, and we're going to see a lot of unemployment next year that will affect many people's uh, level of uh, income security, even if they haven't lost the, their job themselves. So these are two areas that I really think we need to pay attention to. But just to reflect on those four pie charts, I also want to say, there's always two ways of looking at findings uh, like this. And, and these were a snapshot of how people were feeling. But I think the fact that half did say no change, that is encouraging as well. And I think it does show that a lot of people have found ways to cope with the ongoing situation. And we shouldn't forget that as human beings, we are adaptable in the face of adversity. I think the key point for organisations is that we make sure that we are supporting those individuals who do need it in the right way at the right time. With that in mind, if we could have the next slide, thank you. With that in mind, I think in terms of that longer term approach to supporting people's health and wellbeing, flexibility is going to be a really important principle so that we can tailor that support to individual need. Long-term health conditions, whether it is a mental health condition or a chronic uh, condition like long COVID, one condition doesn't affect everybody in the same way. So we can't have a blanket approach, for example, in supporting people who are experiencing long COVID. It really does mean having that really bespoke case by case approach and discussion and, 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 ha and having that conversation with the individual as well, because they're going to be in the best place to judge how their condition affects their interaction with work and what support they need to carry on working, if they can carry on working, of course. And that could mean a phased return to work, adjusting hours, but also adjusting duties where that's needed as well. And I think it's all very well, I'm sure HR are aware of this, but often it's it's managers that are having those conversations on a one-to-one -one level with, with their teams. And they need to really understand how, for example, those uh, long-term health conditions and so on can be fluctuating and how support needs to be flexed and revisited over time as well and how they can have supportive conversations for example around return to work and I know Joe is, is going to be looking at this in a bit more detail as well. Also I just wanted to flag as well if you do have access to occupational health advice often it's only when long-term sick leave has become a problem that referrals are made to occupational health but organisations I think could really benefit from tapping into that more expert medical uh, support at an earlier stage to get to get advice as well. Next slide please. My final slide really is just picking up that theme about how important good people management is on a day-to-day -day basis to supporting people. We know that, first of all, uh, the quality of that relationship that somebody has with their line manager can be really, really beneficial as part of that peer support and, and so on for people's well-being. Now, we also know that there isn't enough investment in this area. And we also know that with the increased pressures on people's health at the moment, so in tandem with that has the pressure on line managers and the level of responsibility to support people in their teams. Many of them will be dealing with a lot of complexity in their personal lives, as well as in their work lives as well. So more and more as well, line managers are likely to be the only link that people have with the organisation, especially if people are working predominantly or completely at home. And they will be that first port of call for people 
most likely if they've got concerns about their, their health or, or a return to the, the, the workplace if that's needed. But also it's managers that are the ones that are going to be keeping in touch most likely with people if they are off sick and how they go about that is really important. And also in terms of the return to work process. And I've mentioned that, that there's that gap between the expectation on line managers to support employees with, with health and wellbeing and, and the gap in terms of the investment, in terms of training, ongoing support, guidance, mentoring, and just all that sort of organisational framework and culture that means that they can go about that role in the right way and have the right kind of behaviour to show empathy and compassion and so on. Now, for, of course, we're not expecting managers to be counsellors or act as medical experts. In fact, that's partly why they need the training and awareness of what their role is, because they could be too easily sucked into situations where they feel they are giving, they are straying into giving advice where they're really not qualified or equipped to do so. So they need to know what the limitations of their role is as well. They also need to know where uh, they can make the most difference. And partly that is being able to refer and signpost to helpful policies and support that the organisation has. Also, if somebody needs to be referred to occupational health or, or a GP and so on. And part of the, a lot of that will take place within the context, hopefully, of a sensitive, supportive one-to-one -one with, with that individual. And that means having relationships that are built on trust, really important. So we have, if we could have the next slide, this is the final slide. And to help organisations skill up line managers uh, in this whole area, we've got a whole range of guidance and support and, and some of it um, is, is set out here and there's, there's links. So I would urge you to go, they're all, they're all free to download these resources on our website. And we also launched this week a whole new suite of line manager guidance in this area. So do visit our website um, and make use of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel, for that, um, for that overview. A few people asking for the, for the data from our latest employee um, working live survey. So I think we need to update that that page, but we will share it with people as soon as possible. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Neil now, who's going to um, talk to us a little bit more about organisational resilience and uh, I think dive into some of that kind of more medical complexity that Rachel was talking about. I'm sure with the lightness of touch, right, Neil? <laughs> Great, yeah, absolutely. Th uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, and pleasure to be here. Um, just to say, uh, um, we pump out most of the data and papers that we do on Twitter. So if you're interested in Twitter and new data, if you uh, feel like following me, please do. That's great. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, just to say, um, I'm a psychiatrist. I served in the military for lots of years. Um, but just over the last um, sort of uh, 10 years, I've been doing lots of academic research looking at organisations. And over the last year, I've been doing a lot of work, particularly with NHS England and Public Health England, uh, in response to the COVID crisis. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we know these data, so I won't spend too much long on them, but basically this is making the point that mental health at work is really important. Uh, next slide, please, and impacts a lot of people. Um, I think there's a, the graph at the bottom is particularly important here, which is from the Labour Force survey that you might know. And what that shows is year upon year, this is self-reported anxiety and depression. And you can see even before COVID, there was sort of an uptick in the, um, in the proportions and numbers of people who are reporting uh, mental health difficulties at work. Um, next slide, please. Um, we talk a lot about absenteeism, but we mustn't forget presenteeism. Next slide, please, which what we know makes a, a really big difference to industry. And this is in particularly important in safety critical work. And of course, there's actually quite a lot of safety critical roles, particularly now where we're all having to pay more attention to safety, uh, physical safety, particularly due to Corona. Um, and certainly if you're in a safety critical role, the mental health isn't just a sort of nice to have, we should do. Um, if you don't get that right, you can have some really dire consequences. Next slide, please. Um, these are all the different sources of data um, papers. Uh, so if you want any of the papers that I talk about, they will be available and these slides will be available. So you get to uh, click and make use of those links. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so during the last um, sort of 10 months or so, it seems like forever, doesn't it? Um, you know, we've been exposed to lots of different traumas. Um, 
actually to be uh, and stressors to be fair these sorts of stressors are actually in the workplace whether covid's here or not um you know we've got trauma uh, a lot at the moment to do with sort of death and dying and and, and difficult decisions um, but but actually there's many occupations that are predictably trauma exposed it's not just the emergency services you know social workers um, health healthcare workers media professionals and the like we know workload and shift patterns makes a difference really good data from the early part of the pandemic in china showing that actually healthcare workers who worked four or six hour shifts had substantially better mental health than health workers who worked 12 hour shifts so actually you know that there definitely does make a difference Home life stresses, particularly lately, you many of us spending much more at home. And although people might be at work, you don't know whether their spouse or partner might have lost their job and have financial difficulties, you know, problems with kids and all course of bereavement, unfortunately, for all too many. And then there's this difficulty of what's called moral injury. Uh, next slide, please. And moral injury is the uh, situation where your moral or ethical code has been challenged. And uh, this can occur either because you did things that you shouldn't have done or you saw things happen that, that really shouldn't have happened. Um, you didn't act or you saw other people not act and you didn't intervene or you feel betrayed, you know, that your organisation or your employer or your colleagues, you know, have let you down when really they shouldn't. And although moral injury is not an illness by itself, it's important because actually what people do is they uh, develop a lot of shame, anger and guilt related to this and that predisposes them and makes them uh, actually much more likely to, to have mental health difficulties. Next slide, please. So what's happened to the general uh, mental health of the general population? I'm just going to show you a few slides, you know, realise that time is tight, just to give you a sort of inkling for what the data shows us from these some really big studies with many uh, tens of thousands of people in them. Next slide, please. So this is looking at uh, anxiety in the general population. Just to orientate you with these graphs, uh, this uses a scale called the GAD7. You don't need to worry about it. It measures anxiety symptoms. It goes from zero to 21. And the red dot you can see is what the normal level of anxiety symptoms are in the, in the population. And what you can see from, uh, from lockdown, you know, this is back in March, is the scores you know, zoomed up and they gradually went down over time, not quite returning to baseline. And there's two studies there which basically show the same sort of picture. So anxiety levels are up, but are gradually coming down. And we don't have data yet on the second lockdown. Um, next slide, please. This is uh, looking with males and females and showing that actually uh, females tend to have higher level of anxiety even beforehand. And those, uh, but the actual pattern of change is, is pretty similar no matter what gender uh, you are. Next slide, please. This is looking at depression. Again, similar sort of picture. The red dot is the baseline and you can see that the level of depression is, is high. Just for your orientation, if you were using this scale clinically, and this is not a clinical measure, and this is here at the moment, it's using to look at the population, then a score of 10 or more would indicate um, depression, you know, if you were to see a GP, for instance. So you can see here, although the overall scale um, levels in the general population isn't um, at, at a clinical level, although it's definitely raised and, and generally coming down. Next slide, please. Um, Public Health England have looked at this and tried to look about which groups are more at risk than others. Uh, I won't go through all of those, you can have the slides, but it's worth looking at the disproportionately uh, affected groups, because there definitely are groups out there, you know, young women, people uh, with children, people who weren't in employment. We also know that there's groups such as we you know, Black, Asian and minority and ethnic, um, and also people who've had coronavirus. So that actually those symptoms I was showing you earlier on are not just um, randomly distributed. There are certain groups that are definitely higher, uh, at more risk. Um, next slide, please. So given all of that, given that actually mental health problems and symptoms particularly have, have increased, you know, what should we do to try and help people uh, in the workplace? Uh, next slide, please. So before people get involved in, in doing challenging work, um, it's really important that you prepare them properly. So we strongly suggest that actually, if you've got a particularly difficult task, you don't just put people into it. You ask them to kind of reflect on that task, having explained what it is and, and to see whether they think they're ready for it. And actually, if they don't, they're not, they're not, they're not ready for it, then, then that's OK. You know, they, 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 you shouldn't be pushing people to go into it. I put that little um, but not. And that but not means there is no role for people like me or for complex psychological screening processes to try and uh, determine whether people are fit enough to do a job. By all means, ask them to check themselves. What do you think? Here's the information. But don't be using scales and questionnaires and psychologists to try and uh, predict who's going to have problems and who's not. Because we don't know how, how effective that is, but all the evidence we have suggests it's pretty ineffective. 
That study there was a seven year follow up study of police officers in Australia. They used a complex, uh, comprehensive mental health assessment and they found it predicted absolutely nothing over seven years. Um, and they used that at baseline when people came into the police force. So really important when you give people information, you don't sugarcoat it. You don't say, oh, this task will be OK, you know, just get on with it. You need, people need to have enough information to make frank decisions. And uh, I think that that should be done, you know, frankly, and then people can decide whether it's right or wrong for them. Nice term here, which is psychological PPE, which is trying to give people the psychological tools to try and cope with adversity. This hasn't got to be complex. And one of the simplest ways is to do something, uh, to use something called a wellness recovery action plan which says before people get involved in difficult tasks, what they should be doing is thinking about the things that normally keep them psychologically safe. Music you listen to, places you go, people you speak to uh, and the like. Um, and actually you make a list of those things, make a plan before you become distressed. And then when you become distressed, you can turn back to that plan and use one of those things on that list. Because when you're distressed, normally you find it very difficult to try and work out what to do to get better. So make a wellness recovery action plan beforehand. And most importantly, make sure people are properly trained for their job. Lots of evidence that actually people who feel that they're out of their depth or not able to do the job they're being asked to do are much more likely to have mental health difficulties. Next slide, please. Um, how to sustain people? Um, well, uh, what we know is that um, in the workplace, and actually generally, the, the thing that really keeps us going, it was interesting to see Rachel's data early on, is, is social support. We know social support is really important. So what I suggest, that, uh, one way to do this, particularly at the moment where we're not at work, is to buddy people up, is to say actually part of your job today is to check in with each other, actually have active conversations, uh, keep a, uh, a sort of watchful eye, and if people have got a difficulty, chat about it, and do, I'm the supervisor, come and tell me if we've got a problem. Really, really important role for supervisors though. So the evidence is that supervisors need to feel confident to have what we call a psychologically shabby, savvy chat. And that can be whenever people have difficulties or sort of at the end of a shift or the end of a particular piece of work. We did some work with NHS England and we've been providing this short one hour uh, training called REACT uh, as an active listening skills package. And what we show is before the training course, um, um, about less, less than half of them, people felt um, sort of that they were confident to support their colleagues. After the training, this is a one hour training, not, not very complex, um, over 85% felt confident. So actually a short bite-sized piece of confidence training uh, to, to sort of boost, boost people's confidence so that they can feel able to speak about mental health can make a really big difference. Big role also for peer support, and there's lots of peer support packages out there, um, you know, mental health first aid, um, um, trauma risk management straw, you know, psychological first aid. What this tells us is that if you put into the workplace people who um, colleagues feel that they are able to speak to, who have got the right sort of skills and who importantly are supervised, that actually they can make a big difference. We've done lots of work on the trim system, which is used in the military and lots of other um, organizations like emergency services and healthcare. And what we find is actually this um, is a really effective package and people who have um, um, been using trim are three times more likely to go forward and seek mental health support. And also importantly, uh, there's less chance of them going off long-term sick. And then the last of the sort of principles about how to sustain people is to use these um, these techniques called pies, uh, which is nothing about eating. E eating, I can tell you. So pies is a, a, a set of uh, approaches that can help people who are acutely distressed recover and and get back to or stay at work. The first principle is proximity, and that says if you've got someone who's having a problem, what you don't do is say, "I'll oh, take time off. I'll come back when you're ready." You do is you support them in the workplace. You reduce their pressure. You increase their support, uh, and, and keep them at work as much as you can. Immediately says that if someone's having a problem, don't let them go gradually downhill. And when you have a chat with them and they say they're fine, you know, say, really, you, you really are? Because actually, you know, people say fine when they don't really mean fine. So immediately says, nip it in the bud. Expectancy says, you know what, when, when, the, when we're in the middle of a pandemic, it's quite usual to have some symptoms. It doesn't mean you're ill. It doesn't mean that uh, you may need to go and seek health care at this point. Let's support you. Let's work out what to do. But expectancy also means that if things don't get better, then we will get you to go and get the right sort of help. And simplicity means that simple things make a big difference to people's psychological health. If you've got someone who's worried about a particular process or a particular job, rather than seeing a psychological health expert, give them the training and mentoring and supervision to do that job because that will reduce their anxiety and stress. Next slide, please. And then when you come to recover, either at the end of the pandemic, whatever that might be, or at the end of a particular 
um, difficult task, make sure you say a proper thank you. It might surprise you, but actually there's good evidence that a proper thank you actually can protect mental health. Get people back to work slowly, they need some time off, and make sure supervisors, once again, have proactive discussions to find out how people are cope with the task, but also sensitively what's going on at home. You won't know about bereavement or financial issues or other difficulties unless you ask about them. And that's really important because you can't deal with them if you don't know they're present. I spoke about moral injury early on. The way to get over that is to try and make sure that every now and again, particularly when people are doing morally challenging tasks, that you do some reflection. And that means you get together as a group and talk not just about the process, but about the impact and how hard it was and how we didn't always have the right answers. And what you're trying to do is to create what we call a meaningful narrative. That's a story that doesn't end up with the individual or the boss being the, the perpetrator or the victim. It ends up with the, do you know what, this was really tough, but in spite of that, we did our best and actually we, we made a difference. And without that sort of reflection and that meaning making, people can end up um, believing versions of their story, which can lead them to eventually become unwell. Keep an eye on people. And if unfortunately they do need help, make sure they get forward to evidence-based care and enough treatment sessions. And I know some of the EAPs out there, you know, tend to provide five or six sessions, which is not a treatment course. Uh, so if they need treatment, make sure they get to the right sort of treatment. Last slide, please. Um, which, so my conclusions of what I've said uh, and my principles are don't over medicalize normal distress. Make sure you adopt a nip it in the bud approach. Build team support as a priority, which is particularly reliant on having psychologically savvy supervisors who feel confident to talk about mental health. You don't need a lot of training to get them there. Those pies approach make a big uh, difference for people who are distressed. Make sure you say a proper thank you, uh, phase the return to work and the time for reflection. And if people do need care, keep an eye on them and get them to the right sort of care um, to help them. Thank you. That's my last slide. Thanks so much, Neil. That was uh, that's brilliant. So much information there. But remember, you can download these slides. So we did race through them pretty quickly. So if you want to look at them a bit more in depth, then um, uh, do have a um, have a look on the CIFD website later and you'll be able to download them. Um, a reminder to please put your questions in the Q&A box um, so I can pick them up rather than in the chat. Um, we've got a couple coming in, but um, we'd love to see some more. So I'm going to hand over to Joe. And while Joe is speaking a little bit more about getting people back to, um, to work and particularly the impact of long COVID, I uh, hope that some of you will uh, have a think about some burning questions you have to ask that we can take after Joe's presentation. Thanks, Joe. Great, thank you so much. And it's it's really fascinating to hear about the work that both Rachel and, and Neil have been doing. And through the work that we've been doing both in my role at Affinity and at Birkbeck, um, it's fascinating to see how many organizations are, are taking excellent steps to make um, tangible solutions available to their staff through this difficult time. I think so many companies we've seen have really stepped up the wellbeing provision um, for their staff and putting in place some of those things that, that Neil was talking about there. And I've put this picture of this escalator with the light at the end, which is really, I think, what we see through so many of the stories that we hear um, when we're conducting research, particularly in relation to, to return to work, and particularly when we're looking at people with chronic conditions, which actually is very much what we're seeing in the range of, of long COVID, where you can see where you want to get to, you know that there are these steps, but you can't quite get to them and you can't quite see them. And so on the next slide, I just wanted to set out what, what I'll cover very briefly and, and signposting you to lots of different resources that you can go and um, access. But setting the scene for the context of supporting return to work and um, looking at what we can do to support people back in. And those of you listening will have various processes and practices in place. And um, some of them will be working and, and I'm sure that some of you will be thinking, how do I help my line managers really take action and, and talk to their employees to make these policies move into, into practice and support our returners? So we'll be looking at the basic principles, getting our line managers to support that return, and also looking a little bit about work adjustments and what we can do to build an igloo to, to help people um, think about what they can do as individuals, but also group and line manager and organizational practices that can really help. And so on the next slide, um, I've got a picture of, of what we often see at the moment, pre oh, sorry, pre-COVID, what return to work looked like. So pre-COVID, return to work was difficult to manage. Many organizations struggle with absence management. When we have talked to people through our research, we've, we've spoken to hundreds of, hundreds of individuals about their return to work journeys and been in a really privileged position to understand what works 
um, for them and, and listen to that, but also to hear really open and honest um, stories of what doesn't work and what has gone wrong through that return to work process. And this little picture just shows often what happens from a line manager and an employee perspective. So the employee might be at home completely clouded with a range of, of different experiences. Many of them are going to be new to them um, that they maybe don't recognize, can't articulate. And then from the line manager perspective, it can look very strange. It can look as if they're maybe just making mistakes, as Neil mentioned. It can look like they're disengaged and maybe they're looking for a new job. Maybe actually they want to go and move organizations and do something completely different. Um, and from a line manager perspective, it can be very difficult to know what best to do. What can I say? How can I address this without overstepping the mark or maybe making things worse? And when we think now and, and returning post COVID, we've got all of those complex issues that we had before, but also this really diverse situation where some people have been continuing to work for many months in the office, um, whereas others will be returning in very different ways as we move through the next few months. So if we think of a pre-COVID scenario, an individual with ill health will be maybe one returning into a team that has had good resources, been well structured, not had too much change over the last few months. And now somebody returning to work is going to be returning into a state of flux and into a state of challenge. So we have people returning perhaps from COVID and experiencing long COVID. As Neil mentioned, there has been the shift in, in mental health and some of the, the mind research suggests that people who haven't previously experienced conditions are now experiencing mental health. So um, that's something to consider. But also this whole wrap of some people have been redeployed and are now going back into altered jobs. Some people have been working at home. Some people have been furloughed and perhaps haven't had good conversation, a good connection with their, envir their work environment all through that period. And some people are returning to new jobs having been made redundant. And so this return is even more challenging. And so on the next slide, um, I just want to focus for a moment on long COVID and a lot of the research around this is just emerging and it's not yet really fully understood what those experiences are and how they cluster and how long they're going, going to, to, to pan out for people. But what we do know is that there are varied post-viral symptoms um, and people report that they fluctuate in, in over time. So it can feel like you're getting better only to be flawed when you've taken that one step forward. And these concerns could be psychological, they could be musculoskeletal, so feeling lots of pains and, and aches, not able to walk to the end of the road when once you would have been on a 10K run. Um, respiratory conditions where they're, they're reporting that they're, they're short of breath, things that like walking up the stairs can, can, can be very difficult, but also can cause panic um, because they're experiencing that, that shortness of breath. And also this deep fatigue. And what we can see here is that there's lots of stuff that we can draw from, from the research and what we know in the past to help inform our return to work strategies. Because we know within each of these different conditions, um, as they come together with long COVID, we can draw on that, that past research. And so thinking about this, we need to support people who are returning, particularly from long COVID, but in all manner of ways to support them to return effectively into these depleted and, and um, in struggle environments. And that puts a real extra pressure on the line manager as we've noticed. So on the next slide, um, we've got some key things to focus on. So the key principles to get things right. And this was from a, a project that we did for the DWP interviewing people across conditions. And these basics are things that often are not in place. Um, even though in policy we would expect them to translate, the lived experience of people returning to work is often they're not communicated at with when they're off work. They don't have those social connections when they're off work. So we need to talk early and we need to, we need to talk now if we want people to feel valued and, and supported on their return. We need to plan and prepare and think about what work might look like as we return and have a, a conversation not necessarily an interview. Um, the last thing you want when you're feeling vulnerable is an interview. Um, have a conversation about what's gonna work and, and how we can move forward. And then take one step at a time. 
And so often we hear people going back into full 100% capacity jobs and, and that's often when they then relapse. And this process of monitoring and reviewing is so important. And I think as we, as we move on, we've got to recognize everybody's journey is different. And through that, we need to be kind and patient with ourselves and, and with each other. And so on the next slide, I've got um, some resources around line manager support. So for, the, uh, for probably about the last 16 years, we've been looking at what are the line manager behaviors? What knowledge do they need to support other people in a sustainable way? So um, first of all, we did some, some work which Rachel um, supported right from the beginning, looking at line manager behaviors to prevent and reduce work stress. And then we also looked at the competencies that line managers need to um, return to work and what is it that a line manager can do and show their employee as they return. Um, and those frameworks are really important because they can be quick views that managers can use to just check in and say, am I doing these things or could I be adding to my portfolio or do I need development in a different area to really make sure that I'm doing all I can as a manager to support that employee back. What we've also seen is um, that as managers are being asked to, to manage flexible and blended systems uh, and blended work, that puts a real pressure on them. We did a, a flexible work intervention for Lendlease. And what we found was the employees really benefited from this flexible work, but the managers were saying, I've got no tools, I've got no, no resources, no computer software to manage this very complex split shift system that people are on. And, and so equipping managers with both the systems and the tools and the time to manage blended work as people all return is going to be absolutely vital. And then at the other, other level, thinking about this fluctuation that Rachel mentioned and having compassionate systems in place that managers can um, use faithfully and not have to skirt around to really make sure that they're, they're looking after their employee. Often what we hear is line managers are perhaps not logging absence in the right way because they know that somebody with a fluctuating condition, if they have one more absence, they're likely to get a disciplinary conversation. And so thinking about how our, our absence management systems work when we know we have such a, a, a volume of fluctuating conditions um, is really important for us to consider. And you can see at the bottom there, the link to the new line manager resources that, that Rachel mentioned, which our colleague Emma Donaldson Fielder has been leading on, but it has lots of links to these, these different resources and also um, interactive things that, that your managers can go through and get a, a, a self-report as well. So on the next slide, um, we need to support our managers, but we also need to think about what work adjustments do we want to promote and how do we enable a conversation around that? We did some work with ACAS to look at what is the evidence for work adjustments, which ones are effective, particularly when it comes to mental health. And we found that there were a number of different classifications. So if we look at our work schedule, our roles and responsibilities, work environment policy, and also additional support, um, very rarely redeployment used um, in terms of the evidence that we saw. But what we could see is there's anecdotal evidence and there's lots of descriptive evidence that um, individuals receiving these adjustments think that they're, they're helpful. But actually in terms of evidence over time, there's much less clarity. And so any organizations that are implementing interventions and, and want to track that, we'd love, to, love to, to speak to you to know what the data is out there. But really we want to be looking at multi-component interventions, encouraging disclosure, offering supervisor support, but also co-worker support, because this focus on relationships, and as both Neil and Rachel said, the social relationships, if they're not there at the beginning, accessing work adjustments, returning to work is all much harder. And this brings us on to the last slide, which looks at our um, igloo model, sorry, just one back, was to, to suggest that um, we need to think about everybody's role in this. Uh, oh, I, one of my slides disappeared. No worries, we'll go, go on to the last one. Um, our Igloo model suggests that what we need to do is we need to think about what an individual needs to do to support themselves. So they need to be equipped with the knowledge to support and sustain their mental health, to manage their boundaries, to self-care. But also we need our groups, our teams, our line managers and our organisations to have a, a significant role in this because nobody can do it on their own. We need all of these things in place. 
And we all have these individual unique return to work needs. So that in itself is a, is a challenge. And so sharing good practice and um, contributing to the research is really, really valuable in that. So that will help us understand what works for whom and under what circumstances. So on the next page, I've got a number of different resources that um, some of them link into CIPD resources, but also at ACAS and on our um, affinity pages. So please do dip in. All of the, the work that we produce is free to access as well. So lots of things for you to, to use and download and use with your managers. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, and again, loads and loads of great resources in there. I think this has been an incredibly resource heavy, well, that sounds negative, I mean it in a positive way, um, whether or not there's loads of stuff for you, to, for you to access. And I know my colleagues are putting some stuff in the chat there as well. Um, we're going to um, go on to questions. We've got about 10, 15 minutes um, for some questions. So thank you for putting those in. Um, first one I'm going to ask is, um, is about line managers. So somebody's asked, we find the managers themselves are under pressure and they don't have the time to undertake training or skill up. Any suggestions on how to tackle this? Uh, Rachel, any initial thoughts on that one? Yes, and I, I'm glad that this question came through because I think it's a really common issue in a lot of organisations. And we see line managers so often being squeezed middle, they've got all the operational demands on them, and then the people management role, and they really are, are squeezed between those conflicting demands. And I don't think there's any easy answer apart from the organisation has to imbue in those managers the importance of the people management role because it's often seen as an add-on and they really need to be operating in their people management role in an organisation that takes health and wellbeing seriously and, and managers really need to understand how actually if they support employee health and wellbeing it's going to make their job easier so they need to see the point in attending training and the training shouldn't be a one-off event anyway it needs to be ongoing and as joe has uh, has set out it's very much about how, how they behave as well and the relationships that that they have so they need to see a point in attending that training but also i think it's making the guidance and so on it available to them in a very practical, easy, accessible way, because having those kind of psychological savvy conversations that Neil has mentioned, well, there are checklists that you can have to make you confident in, in that area as well. So they need to see that there's a point to doing it. Thank you, Neil, you wanted to come in. Yeah, just very briefly, appreciating that managers are sometimes you know, feel too busy and fully subscribe to the points that Rachel said, because actually it's an important task. Another way of doing this, is, of course, is to use uh, trained peer supporters within your team. So what a manager can do is if they haven't got the time themselves necessary to have those conversations, even though they, they know they need to happen, they could say, well, listen, um, you know, Sandra, Pete over here, you know, would you be able to go and do some of this stuff for me and come to me and give me the sort of the distillate of, of what someone said? So that still makes sure that actually those supportive conversations are happening, even if the line manager themselves isn't actually doing them. Because um, I think the responsibility is to make sure they're done. Ideally, do them yourselves, but but not just to let them go because no no one's got time. And Joe, yeah, I'm going to say one of the things that we've been doing, which seems to have been really well received by managers, is to combine online resources, um, so ten minute webinars that are accessible anytime, but with facilitated discussion where managers can come and have an opportunity to just go, this is hard and what do I do? So it's a handheld um, route through, but giving them that space that doesn't feel like they need to go out and find more solutions, but they, they have that space for discussion. Mm, that's something that some of, quite a few of the HR leaders that I work with have been doing is bringing, kind of having those forums for line managers to just come and connect with each other. Because um, obviously it can be quite lonely and when we're working at home, it's harder to, to find those opportunities. Um, got a specific question on, on supporting people with long COVID. So Esther's asked, how can we best support and signpost those with long COVID? It appears they're not currently eligible for any disability or other benefits and may not be able to return to work full time for some months, if at all. Um, jo, can I ask you to, to come in on any more advice on that? I think the, the statutory sick pay and, and the legal implications of, of the long term element I can't answer on, but what we do see is actually when I think often from an HR hat we think about um, does it fall within the DDA or does it not, 
And the reality of conversations that go on with individuals and, and their line managers don't really take any of those sorts of things into, into account. It's about what can we do now? And what we know is if people get back to work, the quicker they get back to work within reason and managing their condition, the more likely they are to stay and work in the long term. And so thinking about a more flexible return where an individual really thinks through what is it that they can do now? Could they do something from home? Could they work on short term projects or, or internal projects that don't have that client delivery, for example? Um, so that they can work at their capacity and it also allows them to be honest and open about when they're feeling unwell and they need to take that time out. Um, and so I think it's it's every case is unique, but the absolute basic principles of, of return to work apply. Thank you. Uh, Rachel, do we have a COPD view on anything kind of long COVID related? I know it's pretty emergent still. Well, it's a really tough one, isn't it? And I, and I think on the one on the one hand, it, it's trying to make sure that um, employees are getting access to the medical support that they need. Uh, there are these new uh, long COVID, I think there's about 40 clinics that have been set up around the country because I know of several people experiencing long COVID and, and some have been getting really, really good support through uh, the NHS and so on. Uh, but actually, even the medical profession is still learning about it and the support hasn't necessarily readily been there. So I, I think that's that's really important side of it. But also, no, we don't know if it is a disability. There's a lot of discussion about whether it will be classed as a disability or some of the impacts of long COVID um, will be classed as a disability, but really it, it, they are going to be dependent, people in that situation, on the kind of support that you can provide. In terms of statutory sick pay, which is for six months, a lot of organisations have topped that up with occupational sick pay. So there's, the finan there's the medical, there's the health side of it, and then there's the financial support as well. So any support that could be provided through your um, employee assistance programme as well, and if you have got occupational health. So it's just exploring all those avenues, but it will make a tremendous difference to that person knowing that their employer is supporting them because they are in a really difficult situation. Thank you. Um, Neil, you talked a lot about kind of evidence-based approaches. Uh, Tess has asked, how do we get more buy-in for more evidence-based preventative approaches? Yeah, it's a really good question because sometimes you can just launch into something think it's going to help. So I, I think actually doing a proper you know, high quality trial can be pretty complex. And I, I get that. But actually doing a simple evaluation of anything that you do actually is not complex. And actually, if you're evaluating something and you do it anonymously, um, actually, you don't even need ethical approval as long as you're not asking questions that are going to identify individual people. So, for instance, that managerial training that I mentioned, the React training, which is this one hour training package. You know, we we got people to fill in a very basic questionnaire, which you could do on something like SurveyMonkey or equivalent beforehand. And then we follow people up one month later, you know, by, by, and, and we got sort of a 60 percent response rate. Um, and so actually doing something simple yourself that isn't complex, I, I think, is, is pretty achievable. You know, taking that, then putting it into, you know, doing a proper trial, I agree, is more complex. But if you don't evaluate, and importantly, you don't evaluate just at the end of a training course, because at the end of a training course, if the instructor's nice and they've had a nice day or, you know, that, that's OK, you have to do something, you know, a month, two months, three months later, because what you're really after, after is not just was the training nice, is what, what's the impact, what difference did that make? Um, so I think, yes, yes to big trials, but actually simple evaluations, I think, are really quite achievable. Thank you, Joe. I was going to say, absolutely agree, Neil. And I also think that as a profession, commissioning work, um, if you're asking about what evaluation has been done and what evidence there is that this works, I think that will push the whole agenda forward because often I find that our clients don't want to evaluate. Um, and so we would love to do that for, for every training course and, and look at it in different ways. So I think if as a profession, we, we constantly ask what evidence is there for this and what outcomes are you expecting um, and how are you measuring that? It will help to increase that, that agenda as well. And obviously being evidence-based is one of our core values at the heart of the CIPD profession map. So that is uh, what we do, would like to see within the profession. Um, Rachel, uh, Matthew's asked, how do you encourage staff back to the office when they have adapted to working from home and have found that beneficial to their well-being? And is it a, an either or? Should we be encouraging people back? And you will need to unmute yourself. 
That's a really good question. And I think a lot of organizations will be finding them in this situation. People, a lot of people have got used to working from home and have found that yes, they've perhaps got a bit more time and they're saving money and they can do um, some activities that, that they enjoy. They can get a work, better work-life balance. It really, really depends on the individual person, whether it's a benefit or not. And I think it means looking at, first of all, their role. Is it something that the organisation could support uh, more permanent long term home working? Also, having a really sort of sensitive, open conversation with that person. Are there underlying concerns actually about returning to a workplace? Because I think a lot of people at the moment, at least, will, will still have concerns about traveling, commuting, go, go into a workplace environment. So is it really necessary for the organization to have that person in the office? You know, it really does mean just taking all those kind of factors into account and, you know, could their job be changed to, you know, would it be really good for their well-being to, to be at home for full time? Uh, we know from our research with employers that they have quite a lot of concern about people working en masse at home all the time. It's not necessarily a panacea for everybody's health and well-being, but it means accommodating people's uh, sort of needs and circumstances as far as, far as you can. Um, but also the needs of the business, you might need those roles to be done in the office. So every situation on, on its own merits, really, and have that conversation. Thank you. Uh, it's quite a long question. Next, I'm just going to truncate and get the, the, the meat of it out, which is how could you, um, have you got any advice on how line managers can support people and kind of get them to open up about their concerns and how they're feeling? So perhaps you suspect that somebody's struggling, but they're not telling you openly. Um, Joe, any advice on encouraging people to open up? It is an incredibly difficult one and even harder when, when it's over, over a remote setting. My position is always to think about what is it that you need to do your, your job well. And so when we've had experience of, of talking to line managers that find talking about mental health difficult or employees who don't want to disclose whether that's cancer treatment or um, chronic pain, it's thinking about, okay, there's a lot going on for you and that's evident. And this is what I see in the work that you're doing. And being very encouraging them to be very specific about what they might need and, and what they're finding difficult and how they could work better. And so using things like the management standards could be a great framework for that. Um, the management standards for, for work stress, thinking, okay, how are your work demands? How do you feel that you're getting enough support? Is there anything that we could do to make your role clearer that could then help you? Um, and that often leads people to open up a little bit more without it being a direct question of going, I'm thinking something's going on at home and that's translating into your work. Um, because really our, our remit is around how are you presenting at work and, and are you okay in, in that context? So um, focusing on, on the specifics there, we find is really helpful. Neil. Um, yeah, and so I think one of the things you can do is obviously if you're worried about an employee, you're worried for a reason. You know, you've seen them crying, you've seen them distracted, their work's not their usual standard. There's something that's led you to that concern. So what you can do is to use that as a lever for starting a conversation. You know, something along the lines of, I hope you don't mind, um, but I, I have noticed that, blah, 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 whatever that is. I, I just wonder, is everything okay? So to use what it is as your start point and do it sensitively, not with the, you know, why'd you do it? But as in, I'm worried about you. And that, that can lead on to a positive uh, conversation. Again, going back to that managerial training that we, that we talked about, you know, those sorts of things are pretty simple to have a few tools in your bag to sort of learn over, over a short package. But I would start off with why is it that you're, you're worried and, and to reflect that sensitively back to the person. I'm just going to ask one very quick one and we'll have to wrap up. Um, what is your opinion on the provision of access to company doctors? So is it something that organisations should be providing, Rachel, do you think? Well, some larger organisations uh, did have occupation, you know, do have occupational um, do doctors through, through their occupational health service and also nurses and the whole range of occupational health prof professionals. Um, and, and I think 
yes, if you can provide that, de yes, definitely, definitely, because the occupational health doctors and so on will have a really, really good understanding of jobs and the work environment. So I think that can be a real, a real benefit. Whereas if uh, you go to your GP and you have a 10 minute consultation, and obviously a GP is a really important um, gateway pathway to, to other services, obviously, um, but you know, it can be a longer conversation to understand um, how your job is affecting your health and what duties and work you might be fit to do. So I, I think, yes, if, if you can provide that, it's a good yeah. thing. Thank you. I'm afraid I'm going to have to finish there because we are uh, on uh, bang on time if I finish very quickly. Uh, thank you very much um, to Neil, Joe and Rachel. Uh, thank you everyone for watching. Thank you for getting your questions in. I'm sorry if we didn't have time to answer them all. Um, a reminder that you will be able to uh, download the slides and you'll be able to watch this webinar again, should you so wish, because it will be available on demand. We will be back next week with our final webinar of 2020, where we're going to be looking at managing conflict. So thanks very much for watching. Have a lovely afternoon and we will see you next time. Bye bye.